All right, today's book of the day, life-changing one. I really mean it on this one. Seneca on the shortness of life. I picked this up, I was traveling in London and I went to Waterstones. That's like their equivalent of Barnes and Noble. And I saw, you know, it's, I already carry so many books with me when I travel. I was like, ah, do I want to buy other books? But I found these little teeny ones up in their classic section. It's always amazing to me. Classic books. These are books that stood the test of time two, three thousand years. They're in some little rinky dink corner in the, that nobody ever goes to and buys. And then all the mark, it just shows you how much marketing influences us, you know, the good books, this book that's stood the test of time. And I open it up and I'm like, oh man, how is this not the book that everybody's reading? He says, you've heard uh, the saying that life is short, but he says, it's not that we have a short time to live but that we waste a lot of it. Life is long enough and a sufficiently generous amount has been given to you for the highest achievements if your time is well invested. But when it is wasted in heedless luxury and spent on no good activity, we are forced at last by death to realize that it has passed away before we knew it was passing. So it is, we are not given a short life but we make it short and we are not ill supplied, but wasteful of it. Now, if you look at my notes here, you can't really see it, but this whole about, well, the second half isn't as good in my opinion, but the first half, it's like, I'm trying not to circle every part of this now. So I'm going to go through this because the book is called on the shortness of life. Life is long if you know how to use it. I, you know, what's the scarcest of all things? I think you could argue it's energy or time. Those are the two scarcest things. And every day you live is a diminishing amount of those left for you. Now, he says, now for some people, they don't like to hear that. And I want to go through this book. This book is important enough uh, that I'm going to go through qu quite a bit of it. I'll do it relatively quickly because it's, it's very focused in what it says, but he says, if you look back at your life, right? And you go, why have I not accomplished whatever it is I want to accomplish? He says, here's the reasons, eight reasons that you haven't gotten what you wanted out of life. Number one, greedy activity. Number two, dedication to useless tasks. Number three, drinking or drugs. Number four, laziness. Number five, worrying what other think, other people think of you. Six, self-imposed servitude to thankless people. Think about your dating life maybe. You spent all this invested or someone in your family or friends, they never gave back, you just gave to them, right? Number seven, pursuing other people's money or worrying about your own. He's saying making someone else rich or, heedless, or, or endlessly worrying about making yourself rich. But listen to this number eight one, he says, going after no fixed goal, tossed about in ever-changing plans by a fickleness, which is shifting. You know, I've been guilty of all eight of these, but I would say number eight is probably the one that gets at all of us. And you know, if you're, if you're in the 67 steps that I, that I have, or if you're watching any of the videos that I talk about here, here in YouTube or podcasts or whatever, uh, I say it, you have to start with defining your end game. What's the end game goal you want? Do you want to be a billionaire? Do you want to be the next Martin Luther King Jr.? Do you want to be the next Einstein that discovers new theories? Pick a goal. I was in the UK with, if you saw that video with John Lee, and one of the things I like he said the most was when I asked for you know his parting words of wisdom he would leave. Uh, with the planet if he was to die tomorrow. He said, I would leave, do something, even if it's the wrong thing. I was teaching in the, uh, if you're in my, I've got a VIP program and I was going through the book by Sam Walton called uh, Made in America. And he lists out the 10 things that made him the richest man really of our time, um, maybe of all time. But he says that number one is you have to have commitment to something. So. Picking a goal and committing to it. 
Joel Salatin used to say, pick one thing even if it's the wrong thing. So just think of these these eight. You may have uh, a tendency towards one, maybe drinking some of you. Self-imposed servitude to thankless people. That's a horrible one. Anyway, so he keeps going through life. He, uh, through the book. It is a small part of life we really live. Indeed, all the rest is not life, but merely time. So if you violate these eight principles, what will end up happening? And I see this, like you go outside and you just look and you're like, everybody is just passing time. They're not living life. You know that Thoreau saying, the mass of men live lives of quiet desperation. What is called resignation is confirmed desperation. And, and that's, that is, that's the world that you're in right now. You have to be different than them. He says, one of the things you have to start with is being not so uh, liberal with your time. He says, you will find no one willing to share out all their money. But to how many people do we divide up our life? People are frugal in guarding their personal property. But as soon as it comes to squandering time, they're most wasteful of the one thing in which it's right to be stingy. So he's saying, don't be stingy with money, but be stingy with your time. You know, if you're in a movie and it's a stupid movie, get up and leave. If you're at a party and there's no end game goal and you're around horrible people, get up and leave. Be stingy. Ha, think about yourself. Like, I know a ton of stingy people. They're stingy when they tip a waiter. They're stingy with valet. They're stingy with charity. That might be you. What he suggests, Seneca here, you know, the great philosopher, he said... Switch it up. Be liberal with those things because you can always earn those back if you over tip somebody. Who cares? You can make more money, but you can't get back time. Uh, so let's see. Keep going through. I just took out some of the tidbits. That was from page four. Get this book, by the way. You have to buy this. A must buy. Uh, so then he goes in that we become the problem, the reason we waste, is our mind is overactive. He says, generally agreed that no activity can be successfully pursued by an individual who is preoccupied. So think about your life. What preoccupies you? Are it the big, is it the big picture, most important things, where you're going, how you're going to get there? Or are you thinking about what you're going to wear today and, you know, what color you're going to paint your walls or what time? Uh, are you going to that dinner with a friend? Is that really important? Because he says, since when the, the mind, when distracted, absorbs nothing deeply, but rejects everything when it's crammed, when the brain is crammed. See? Living is the least important activity of the preoccupied man, yet there is nothing which is harder to learn. So, he's saying the hardest thing for you to learn is how to live. And you've got to start, if you're writing this down, number one, you cannot have a preoccupied mind. And if it is preoccupied, make sure you don't fall prey to one of the 25 cognitive biases, which is misweighting. You can't be thinking for hours on things that you should only be thinking about for minutes and thinking about for minutes the things you should only be thinking about. I mean, the things you should be thinking about for hours. Your career how to have impact in the world is going to take tremendous time and tremendous brain power to think through. Think on that. Don't be preoccupied. But learning how to live takes a whole life. And which may surprise you more, it takes a whole life to learn how to die. It takes a while to get to that end game goal. That's what I think he means by dying. But here's something interesting. On page five, and I... I I think he's speaking to me and you might feel the same way. He said, the problem is you're living as if you're destined to live forever. Your own frailty never occurs to you. You don't notice how much time has already passed, but squander it as though you had a full and overflowing supply. So many people, even when I bring this up, people are like, oh, it's so negative. Like it's not negative. It's not negative at all. It's not negative, it's realistic. He says, you act like mortals in all that you fear and like immortals in all that you desire. So, you know, think about your brain. The amygdala part of your brain, the strongest 
or one of the strong uh, strongest areas in your brain or, or most overpowering I should say the amygdala controls your fear memories so you and I are like continually moved from right to left by fear which he says we act like mortals in fear oh, oh God, what if this person what if my husband leaves me or my wife leaves me or what if I go bankrupt but then he says in the things you desire like yeah these are my big picture goals we go so slow at them as if they're always going to be there I think he's suggesting fear less on some of those other things. It's going to happen. Someone's going to betray you. Don't think about it all the time. It's going to happen. I mean, try to avoid it. But when you think about your end game goals, that's where you need to build up the fear. Like, what if I don't get it? Let me work harder. And not paralyzing fear, but motivating fear. Huge differentiation. All right. How late is it to begin really to live just when life must end? How stupid to forget your mortality and put off sensible plans to our 50th and 60th year, aiming to begin life from a point at which few have arrived. He's saying, you know, he goes through talking about, I think Augustus Caesar, some of these great people in life. And he said, all they could think about was what they would do when they retired. And that's how the world is now. It's Picasso's dichotomy. I've talked about that, you know, for Picasso said, do not live the dichotomy where you do what you don't want in order to save up money uh, to have time to do things in your spare time. He's like, make your spare time and work the same. So what he's saying is that most people, and this is de this was true thousands of years ago, and it's definitely true today, most people literally live as if they're sure they'll get to retirement. You don't know. So if you're putting off what you should be doing, doing something you know has no end game goal, working in the job or dating somebody or having a friend that you know is not going to be there in the long run or you don't want to be there in the long run but you're just going to do this a little longer he's saying how stupid to forget our mortality he says but if you, each of us could have the tally of his future years set before him as we can of the past how alarmed would be those who saw only a few years ahead and how carefully would they use them and yet, it is easy to organize an amount, however small, which is assured. We have to be more careful in preserving what will cease at an unknown point. So, he's saying, if you knew, if you look back on your life, or I should say first, if you could look forward and see that you only have five years left, one year left, one day left, maybe 50 years. I don't know. You don't know. And that's the point. How differently would you live, though, if you knew a certainty? But he said here, it's even worse or not worse, it's even more uh, important that you plan because it will cease at an unknown point, my life and your life will. So he's saying, get your butt in gear. Can anything be more idiotic than certain people who boast of their foresight? They keep themselves officially, officiously preoccupied in order to improve their life. They spend their lives in organizing their lives. Man, this uh, when I read that, I highlighted that 30 times. Are you guilty of this? Do you spend your life in organizing your life? He's saying that in a negative way. Are you directing your purposes with an eye to a distant future? But putting things off is the biggest waste of life. It snatches away each day as it comes and uh, denies us the present by, by promising the future. The greatest obstacle to living is expectancy, which hangs upon tomorrow and loses today. You are arranging what lies in fortune's control. And abandoning what lies in yours. Can anything be more idiotic than you and I planning our lives but never living our lives? That's what he's saying. And he said the greatest obstacle to living a good life. He brought up earlier the preoccupied mind. Now he brings in a new point. It's living life with expectancy. Being sure that tomorrow you'll have a day to do something that you could do today. It reminds me of the famous saying, you know, do not put off for tomorrow what you can do today. The whole future lies in uncertainty. Live immediately. He does not say uh, YOLO. That's not what he means. It's not like just eat, drink, and marry for tomorrow, tomorrow we die. That's, you know, an Epicurean understanding. He's saying live immediately. Go toward your goal. Not tomorrow. You might not accomplish your goal. You might not achieve your goal to the future, but you can start today. 
It's the ultimate book about eradicating uh, procrastination. He says, you must match time's swiftness with your speed in using it. He said, life's short, so you better act quickly. He said, life's divided in three periods, past, present, and future. Of these, the present is short. The future is doubtful. The past is certain. So the only thing we have with certainty is something relatively irrelevant, the past. <clears throat> now, one of the things I liked is he talked about as you start going towards your end game goal, be careful of a few traps. He talks about people who reflect how pointlessly they acquired things they never would enjoy and how all their toil has been in vain. But for those whose life, he's talking about business. Uh, he says, this is on page 16. Don't toil to acquire things that once you get them, you'll be like, I didn't really want this. That's keeping up with the Joneses. It's okay to make money. I believe in that. It's, it's okay to be capitalistic or enter into the workforce. I'm not even a capitalist per se, but we live in a capitalist world. So I'm capitalist. <laughs> so are you, by the way. You're watching this on something built by capital capitalism. But... Uh, what he's saying is it's very easy to work towards something. He says that somewhere else. It's one of the most tragic things to work for something. And then once you get it, realize this didn't do what I thought it would do. So be very clear. Like if you want to make a billion dollars because you think it will make you happy, that's a bad reason. Cause we already know scientifically it makes you a little happier to be a billionaire. But if you have an end game goal, like Bill Gates goes, I want to eradicate poverty from Africa and me having a billion dollars will give me the power and the control over resources to accomplish that, then go out and make a billion dollars. See, that's an example of an end game goal, right? Then you make your life on a day to day consistent with that end game goal. He says, uh, of all people, only those who are at leisure, who make time for philosophy. So in this book, as he goes through this about us wasting our time, the answer he ends up giving us is that you must make time for philosophy. Now, he doesn't mean what you might think about philosophy. He doesn't mean like philosophy in the sense of reading philosophy, Nietzsche and you know Schopenhauer and Bertrand Russell and all that. What he really means here uh, is, uh, I think, well, the contemplation of life, the understanding of life, the planning of life, the curiosity of life, right? He says, for they not only keep a good watch over their life, but they annex every age to theirs. And now he starts getting into like really studying, which is what I'm talking about, book a day. That's to him as philosophy. He says, you will annex to you. You will bring into your life all the good things from throughout history into your brain. All the years that have passed before you will be added to your life in terms of experience, knowledge, ability to not make mistakes. All the distinguished founders of holy creeds, he's talking about the wise people of the past, men and women, were born for us and prepared will prepare a way of life for you. The toil of others, we are led in the presence of things which have been brought from darkness into life, meaning you don't have to toil and go through the struggle if you study what other people have struggled with. We're excluded from no age. Doesn't matter, you can study Gandhi even though he's dead. You can study Aristotle even though he's been dead for thousands of years. We're excluded from no age, we have access to all. We're prepared in loftiness of mind to pass beyond the narrow confines of human weakness. Since nature allows us to enter into partnership with every age, why not turn from this brief and transient spell of time today and give ourselves wholeheartedly to the past, which is limitless? Will Durant would say the best philosophy is history. I just say, let's sum it up and make it more practical. Read more. That's what he's talking about. That's how you will acquire, obviously. That's what he was talking about. So, uh, he says... None of these people will be too busy for you. None of them will send you away. Uh, 
not happier and more devoted than you were before. They're at home to you mortals by night and by day. The knowledge, and, and I'm going to just change his words a little bit because when he said philosophy, he clearly meant reading the philosophers, right? Books, you got to read more. Seminars, YouTube videos, audio books, whatever it takes, you got to pull knowledge into your brain. That's what he says is the way to not waste your life. Then he goes on. Uh, we're saying we're in the habit of saying we're not in our power to choose the parents that were allotted to us. But they were given to us by chance. That's true. You did not choose your parents. I did. And so many people, as, we get, as all of us get older, we start to blame our parents for things they didn't do right. But he says, but we can choose whose children we would like to be. He's saying, become the children of the world's greatest people. Uh, Charlie Munger calls that making friends with the eminent dead, right? So I recommend that you and I become friends with the eminent dead. Eminent meaning great. Those people are no longer with us, but they're with us right here. So the life of the philosopher extends widely. is not confined by the same boundaries as for others. If you want a, your life to be without bounds, you want to rise above the masses. I was reading Nietzsche's book, uh, Man Alone with Himself. He says in all of us has that innate feeling that we want to rise above. And this is how Seneca advises he does that. If you want to be alone to be free from the laws that limit the human races and all ages, you must step back out of the fray, step back out of this mindless planning to plan and just majoring in minors all day that most people Take 15 minutes a day, sit in a chair, read a book, think. <clears throat> he says, so it is inevitable that life will not just be very short, but very miserable for those who acquire by great toil what must be kept by greater toil. They achieve what they want laboriously. They possess what they achieved anxiously. And meanwhile, they take no account of the time that will never more return. You must. And he's talking about just aimlessly going after material pursuits, whether it be money, love, that's a material pursuit, another human, health. He said you must retire from these pursuits to the pursuits which are quieter, safer, and more important. I says to do this, you have to ensure we do not waste our energies pointlessly or in pointless activity. Think about what you did yesterday. How much of us it was pointless activity, did not contribute to anything. That doesn't mean you can't take a break, you can't have fun, because fun, recreation, can be part of the end game. you got to take a break. Uh, I think it was Nietzsche, in fact, who did not follow his own advice because he ended up going crazy at one point. He said, you got to let your brain relax sometime, and that's okay. But you can under-relax or over-relax, and most of us are over-relaxed. Our brain's working, but not on anything important. So... He begins to say, so let all your activity be directed to some object. Let it have some end in view. So if you're taking a break, take a break because you need a break from the activity that you were doing that was getting you towards you want, what you wanted. Pick your end game goal. What do you want to be? A great sushi chef? You want to own a hotel chain? You want to be a great mother or father? You want to build amazing you know, architectural masterpieces? You want to be an actor? Whatever. Pick your goal and don't be pointless in your activity. Uh, interesting, he says, uh, anyone who wishes to live life should not engage in many activities, either privately or publicly, meaning, of course, useless ones. So look through your life. What's the useless ones? You play too much video games? That's useless. You're just making money for the video game company. You watch too much TV. The average person, I think, in America watches three or four hours of TV a day. Some TV is okay, but it starts to cross the line. Now, he so said, when you make your plans, you should make ourselves flexible so that we not pin our hopes too much on our set plans and can move from thing to thing which chance brought us. Okay? To do that. He said, your mind must be recalled from external objects into yourself. So you got to go inward. Now, 
talked a lot about the answers are not within, and I continue to believe that. He says here the answers is in philosophy and studying great people. But you must go inward to process what you took in from the outward. That's why the inward and the outward must work together. A lot of people just focus on the inside. The answer's all within. No, you need the raw ingredients coming in, but they get mixed up. It's like salad, you know? Put You buy the lettuce from this farm or this grocery store, the carrots, this, you bring them all together in one bowl, you gotta mix them. That's you going inward. Uh, it says you have to withdraw from things that are pointless, right? We should withdraw a lot into ourselves. The mind should not be kept continuously at the same pits of concentration. But you need some diversion, he says, too. Socrates did not blush to play with small children. Cato soothed his mind with wine. And Scipio used to deport uh, his self triumphantly to relax. So it's okay for you to relax a little bit. It wasn't uh, Nietzsche, by the way. It was actually. The two things must be mingled and varied, solitude and joining a crowd. So he's saying, don't be overly social. Or too, uh, you know, too hermit-like. He said, do both. The one will make you, being a hermit, will make you long for people. And the other, when you're too much with people, will make you want to have solitude. Each one is a remedy for the other. Solitude will cure our distaste for a crowd. And a crowd will cure our boredom with solitude. Yet at all times. You must be stimulated to rejoice, stimulated to rejoice without restraint. And austere soberness must be banished for a while. That's what he also means. Have fun. That's what I was saying. So as we go through this book, it's absolutely vital that you read this book. Just keep in mind the big picture point. We waste our lives in about eight different ways. Okay. Number two, uh, the problem is not that life is too short. It's that we don't invest it. So then he says the next point that you must remember is that you can't be miserly with your money, frugal with your money, and just spread your time out there. Be frugal with your time. If you're doing something that has no end game goal, stop. Be frugal. Be cheap with your time. Now, then he says what you must do is you must begin to go into a place where you become a little mini philosopher. And I don't mean philosopher in the sense of, you know, what you learn in school. I mean somebody who reads, learns, loves knowledge. That's really what a philosopher is. Just someone who loves ideas, you know, loves the experience, books, knowledge, seminar, just a lover of learning. He says by doing that, you annex, you take into yourself all the greats of all time into your brain. He says you become timeless. Then he says you must begin to hone down a specific goal that you want, that you invest in. And then he says, put all your energy towards it. But he balances out by saying, take some time to relax, some downtime. He said, even Socrates, even Scipio, even Cato took some time, drank some wine, have some fun. Okay. And last but not least, he said, don't spend your time planning and fruitlessly being, I call it flurries of activity, just doing stuff all the time, mindlessly doing stuff. Major in the majors, take time, step, spend 15 minutes sitting in a chair every day, reading, thinking, reading the greats. So, question for you. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe here on my channel, right below. Subscribe, give out all this good stuff. Uh, if you're listening on a podcast, subscribe to the podcast. Uh, if you haven't already, leave me a review. If there's a comment for you, I want you to leave a question for you. Two questions. What's your end game goal? Simple as that. Number two, what frivolous activity are you doing that you got to just cut and be more frugal with your time? Number three, uh, which... Uh, uh, Which area is it reading? Is it going to more conferences? Is going to make you more of a philosopher so that you make friends with the eminent dead, with those great people in life. So go to tylopez.com, join my free book of the day. I put these out, it'll help you read faster. 
I do it, the reviews for you, it's free. Uh, it's at tylopez.com, put your email in, and uh, this is Seneca on the shortness of life. Also my books, if you go to tylopez.com slash books, you can get uh, a link to buy this book on Amazon. It's pretty cool, or you can just go to the bookstore and get it. It's really cheap, it's like a $3, $4 book. So, But don't judge a book by the amount of money you spend. It's not always correlated. So thanks so much. Reach out to me at Twitter. Uh, I answer my Twitter at tylopez.com. You can also email me at ty at tylopez.com. Believe it or not, those emails do come to my phone and I check them. Can't always answer them, but I usually do. All right, talk to you soon. Stay tuned for the next book of the day.